All right. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. For everybody who has just joined us, welcome to Oyster Hour. This is the first of a three-part series where we're going to discuss the challenges and benefits of hiring for remote teams. I'm joined by Marissa and Tara, and we'll get them introduced in just a second. But some housekeeping around the Zoom webinar. If you've not had the pleasure to use Zoom as a tool for webinars in the past probably million or hundreds of webinars that you've been on during the lockdown, welcome and thank you for coming. Us panelists, we can see each other, so you'll see us interact with each other. We, however, cannot see you as attendees, so the best way to participate, because we do want this to be hands-on and useful for all of you, is to use your chat functionality. So if you could, if you have not already, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, who you are, where you're dialing in from. And throughout the webinar, I will pause for audience questions. Feel free to also leave those in the chat or you can use the Q&A functionality as well. So thank you for joining and we're going to get started. My name is Allie Green and I am the founder of Kohana.io and partnering with the awesome company Oyster to be moderating this panel. Oyster is a software-based employment platform that enables companies to employ great talent wherever they're located. And I love this concept as someone originally from the US that has lived in Canada and now living in Spain. The idea of having distributed companies and bringing in talent from wherever they can be most productive and also most uh, happy and excited about their life is something that I feel really passionate about. And so when I first met the Oyster team, I was very excited to be able to collaborate with them on exploring what does the future of hiring look like and what changes do hiring managers, people ops, and CEOs need to be aware of as we enter this new landscape of emergency work from home and remote work to proactively and intentionally building diverse global teams and doing it in a way that offers the most opportunities to the most people. And that's something I'm proud to say that the Oyster platform allows. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna dive deep into what that looks like and how you can start thinking about hiring remotely for the first time. So before you even think about things like sourcing candidates, which will be webinar two, or the actual interviews themselves, which will be later next month, what changes should be made when you're designing and adapting the whole hiring process from the job specifications to the final offer? And that's something I'm honored to have Marissa and Tara joining me to be talking about today. So I'm gonna pass it off to you, Marissa. I'd love for you to introduce yourself and share a little bit more about Seed. Cool. So. Um... Hello everybody, I'm Marissa Bryan. I live in London. Um, I have lived here now for about six years. London, United Kingdom, I should specify for the Canadian folks that are on the call with us today. Um, so I've lived here for, for just under six years. Um, prior to that, I lived in Paris in France for about uh, 10 years. And prior to that, I'm born and bred in Sydney in Australia. So. Um, I have been moving around the world and being remote from all kinds of different things for a very long time. Um, I am the head of client operations for an organization based here in the UK called Seed. Um, at Seed, um, we build the teams that help ship the products that are touched by millions. So essentially, we partner with tech companies and game studios across Europe to help them achieve their talent and their people ambitions no matter what phase of growth they're at. So whether you're building a recruiting function in a seed or early series A, perhaps you're you know, scaling a company series B through, through D, E and F even, some of the, the companies you work with, um, we're here helping them scale their hiring operations or advising on initiatives around best practice in HR and people, things like employer branding, diversity and inclusion, GDPR, I'm saying that for you, Tara just because I'm sure that's one of your <laughs> favorite subjects. Um, and we've taken care of more than 50 different um, ambitious, young, up starting, starting up kind of tech companies based here in, in Europe, primarily. Um, Klarna, Graphcore, uh, Supercell, who make Clash of Plans, and BulbEnergy.co.uk, which is a, one of the biggest alternative energy um, organizations based here in the UK, just to name a few of the different people that we work with. And I lead the people teams that are helping out all of these companies. 
so there you go. Awesome, thank you. I can't wait to dig into some of the similarities and the differences that you've seen yeah. in the hiring <laughs> process amongst these 50 tech companies around the world. And Tara is joining us from Remote Law Canada. Um, Tara, why don't you give our attendees here an introduction to yourself? Absolutely. So welcome, everyone. I'm Tara Vazdani. I'm the principal lawyer and founder of my law firm, Remote Law Canada. I'm a lawyer here in Toronto. We are very similar to London. You know, we're a common law system. And essentially, I got involved in the remote workspace about a year ago. Uh, I became very, very involved almost sporadically as I was looking into a lot of the legal implications of hiring a digital nomad workforce. So one of the things that I often speak on are the differences legally between a digital nomad and a remote worker. And as Ali has mentioned, you know, now we've got this transition into remote work on a larger scale than ever anticipated before. And you're seeing a lot of overlap between the issues that come up between digital nomads and remote workers. So as I got involved in that space, you know, kind of from this nerdy perspective of what, how do you deal with a digital nomad in an employment law world and landscape, I slowly moved into the remote workers. And now what I deal with is essentially what we're talking about today, hiring, training, and developing remote teams. And so a lot of the things that we look at are remote employment agreements, uh, health and safety checklists, ergonomic assessments, remote work policies, and all of the documents that you need to successfully set up your distributed team. So, you know, while I work on more so the legal side and the document side and what tends to be a little bit boring for some people, but is totally exciting for me, you know, I, I work very much and closely with people like Marissa who deal with a lot of the people and the ops that go on behind the scenes. So I'm very happy to be here uh, setting up, you know, your, your workforce appropriately and in a very, very stable way such that your documents and your arrangements won't be challenged in the future is my passion. And that's what we do at Remote Law Canada. We absolutely love it. And I'm very, very pleased with the way that our, our uh, current international work landscape is changing. Yeah. And I love that prior to found, founding Kohana, I was the director of people for a fully distributed company, but I was their first digital nomad. And so as a full-time digital nomad and the full-time director of people, um, seeing where those laws didn't add up and having that actual experience because it was personally affecting me as well as professionally impacting me made me so much more appreciate the insight that people focused on the legal aspects of hiring and benefits can have when it comes to what is the evolution of the laws and what should you pay attention to? What are the risks? And so I'm really excited to dig into that with you today, Tara. Um, thank you both Marissa and Tara for being here. So as I mentioned um, prior to my current passion of just continuing to advocate for remote work and educating people on best practices when it relates to things like hiring and communication, collaboration and trust, one of the things that I did in my previous organization was that of people and thinking through how do you design a hiring process. And one of my favorite stories from those past four years was the fact that while we were a remote first, completely distributed organization, we decided to hire an office manager. And this makes me laugh now, especially because I'm in a lot of people ops Slack groups and they're asking, well, are we getting rid of our office? Are we not getting rid of our office? If we do that, what roles do we need to hire for? How does this change who we hire and what skills we're looking for? And, and I laugh about this idea of hiring an office manager because it's just a title. And at the end of the day, if you remove job titles from the description and you really narrow down to what are the skill sets that people are bringing to the table? What behaviors do I want to reward in the organization? And how can I find people that are going to step up to that challenge? It really changes the perspective in which you do things from even getting buy-in amongst the leadership team to hire for an open role or doing things like writing out the job specifications. What should you be asking of candidates in terms of qualifications? What legally can you ask? 
and how do you decide? And so those are some of the topics we're gonna dig into today. And so Marissa, I'd love to start with you. I know Seed works with companies from companies that are building out their hiring for the very first time to helping companies just continue to develop their strategies and scale their teams. And so when it comes to this idea of workforce planning and translating that into an actual hiring plan, what are some of the top tips that you give to these talent teams when they're trying to reimagine what types of roles should I hire for? How can I hire for them remotely? And where do I even start in this process? I think, um, firstly, it's not the same for everybody. I think, uh, you know, it would be great if I could give you a, a, a you know, a, a top three hits or something like that, that would apply to all companies in all locations, in all different sectors. Um, I, uh, you know, it's just not going to be the same for everybody. We work with a lot of startups, a lot of companies where maybe you've got a founder, um, a, you know, a CTO, perhaps, you know, a handful of engineers. And when you're at the very early stages of crafting your company, crafting your culture, your values, your mission, there is genuinely a perception that people must be in close physical um, proximity in order to be able to do that. Um, I think if anything, what we've learned over the last few months is that if you remove the possibility of people being in close physical proximity, it's pretty amazing what you can achieve. You know, um, the Democratic National Convention is happening right now in the US virtually. If you'd have said to somebody a few years ago that that would happen virtually, so, you know, they would have laughed in your face. And I think, um, you know, all of this, all of the behaviours that we, we, we were so accustomed to have just been exploded and we've had to adapt. Um, which is sort of one of the things that I would challenge a lot of early stage companies. If you couldn't, what would you do? Um, if, you, if you couldn't have people in close proximity to build your culture and build your values, how would you do that? Um, and one of the, the themes that we collect a lot of data from all of the companies that we work with, one of the themes that we're hearing loud and clear from the candidates that we're talking to, these are, you know, people who are, top level, senior level engineering leaders, um, product data scientists, like very in demand talent across Europe that we're engaging with for many of the different organizations that we work with. And we collate a lot of data about why they would or why they wouldn't move into that particular role with that particular organization. The people have spoken, they want to work remote and they want to be flexible. They want to work from, you know, they, they, they have seen the, the challenges they've experienced as a family, with their friends, with their you know, older relatives. If you're from, and I, I use a random example, if you're from Bordeaux in France and a company is, insists that you be living and working in Paris, and that means that you have to sacrifice all of those personal things to be physically present in a place that, let's face it, is three hours away by train, um, then, you know, is that something that you're going to do if your current employer has already adapted and said, you know what, you can be, you can stay in Bordeaux. We don't need you to come in Paris for the last five months. You've been doing just fine. So I think what we're, what we're going to see over the next little while is a lot of candidates, a lot of top talent pushing back and saying, I'm good where I am. They let me work from home, you know, four days a week or even five days a week. I'm prioritizing balance, I'm prioritizing my mental health, I'm prioritizing my family, et cetera. I don't need to be in your office after having a stressful two hour commute five days a week to prove my value to you. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, that's, that's probably my top tip right now is listen to what we're being told in the market and adapt because to use those, you know, Darwinian type phrases, if you don't adapt, you won't survive. Um, Facebook, one of the biggest companies in the world that for a very long time had a very, very anti work from home policy that is endemic to the Silicon Valley. And I can speak with authority on that because I've worked for five different companies based there, have, you know, come out globally and said, as long as you tell us where you live so that we can adapt your salary accordingly. So there's always a little bit of a kick, you know, for, for the business as to why they might want to do this. But they've said, you know, we'll, we'll happily let more than half of our workforce work remotely. And it, it, it means that they can, you know, scale their business with 
the talent that's available with the, with the best talent that's available rather than scaling their business with those few thousand people who are willing to up six and move to California. Um, and I think that's, you know, if the, one of the biggest companies in the world can do that, the smallest companies in the world can do that as well. Yeah, and I, I hopefully that answered the question. The, the <laughs> Facebook example is one that I've definitely seen garner a lot of controversy in terms of salary. And so, thinking through the legal implications, Tara, I'd love to know, like, when you're planning out a new role remotely. So, let's say a hiring manager they're hiring next month for for a new person, and they really have listened to the market, as Marissa said, and they said, "Okay, I'm going to make this job remote." Well, what are the things that that manager or the hiring team or the HR team should be thinking about in terms of how you create that job specification? Maybe it's around salary. Maybe it's about exempt or non-exempt hours or contractor or full-time employee or a lot of these things that can sound like jargon to people. What advice do you have for teams that are navigating this for the first time? Absolutely. So, you know, Facebook is an excellent example. And I think location specific salaries aside, there's a lot more pieces to the puzzle. So in terms of location specific salaries, I mean, this is in my opinion, an advantage point for employers that are hoping to create distributed teams. Typically in any given jurisdiction, salaries have been commensurate with whatever location the employee was operating in. So for example, in Canada, salaries tend to be lower in Ottawa versus Toronto because the cost of living is higher in Toronto. I think Facebook's model based on location specific salary is entirely appropriate. What employers need to be considering much more is the way that they are going to allow their employees to work from home. So you've touched on it, Ali, in terms of drafting employment contracts, some of the things that you wanna consider are hours of work, uh, whether the employee has any head office attendance obligations, insurance requirements, is the home insurance and contents insurance gonna cover a lot of the tools that the employees need to operate remotely and what's gonna happen in the event of a slip and fall or a some sort of workplace injury? How will that workplace injury be reported and what sort of documents will protect the employer and protect the employee from any potential workplace injury? So for example, we have health and safety checklists that allow the employee to speak to the safety of the workspace and also allow the employer to set certain requirements as to the safety of the workspace, things like that. So in terms of, you know, and, and just, it is, you know, not to go into too much legal jargon, what you would want to set out is first and foremost in an employment agreement, set out exactly how the arrangement is going to work. Typically employers, especially operating in this emergency remote work scenario have not met a lot of these requirements and will face certain things like constructive dismissals, et cetera, down the line, because they didn't set out exactly what the work hours will be, exactly what the workspace needs to look like, et cetera, et cetera. So from, you know, from the kind of holistic perspective, when drafting the employment agreement, you definitely want to set out what are the hours of work that the employee is expected to be available and responsive? What are the break times? What is the sign off time? Are they expected to attend the head office at all? What are the requirements of the workspace? Um, and what are the insurance requirements really? As an employer, you also want to set out whether there is a unilateral right to recall the employee at your will. That piece in and of itself is what's going to become the most, uh, I guess, contentious throughout this entire COVID-19 pandemic. So right now you have a lot of employers that have transitioned to remote work indefinitely, supposedly, but believe that once things calm down, they're going to recall their employees. In Canada, and you know, I'm sure it's the same in the UK and in the US and in many jurisdictions across the world, once you make a fundamental change to the employee's employment relationship or the way that they work, if you were to allow the employee sufficient time to agree to that change, that has become a, a term of their employment relationship with you. So if now we're in a scenario where you've been allowing them to work remotely for five months and they've proven that they can meet certain productivity requirements and efficiency requirements, and now you want to recall them back, there is potential to say that they have been constructively dismissed if you do recall them. 
So do you have an employment agreement or do you have a remote work policy that as an employer gives you that right to recall the employee at your will? Now, on the flip side, from the employee's perspective, if you've gone in and said, yes, absolutely, I'm going to continue or I'm going to work from home, um, and you've agreed, for example, to a reduction in work hours. So I had this question come in from a client of mine yesterday. Well, we reduced our employee salaries on X. Is there a requirement to bring them back to their regular salary once all of this is over? And really, what is, you know, what is the date that all of this is over and who measures that? So my response was, well, you know, if the employee had actually spoken to an employment lawyer, they would have realized that what they should have done when there was a reduction in their salary is shot off a quick email to the employer and said, I'm agreeing to this reduction in my hours and salary for now throughout the course of this pandemic with the expectation that eventually my regular work hours and my regular salary will return. Well, if they didn't do that, which they didn't do when my client yesterday had reduced her work hours, technically they've agreed to the change. So in the same way that the employee will make the argument, well, you've allowed me to work remotely for all this time, so you've agreed to that change in my employment, the employer can make the argument, well, agree to the salary reduction and it, it, it that con constitutes a change in the in the employment relationship and you can't go back. So all of these legal considerations, and I know it sounds like a lot, I invite anyone to, to really connect with me, but the key is on the employer side to draft an employment agreement that sets out the requirements of the arrangement sufficiently enough such that you can control, and control is not the best word, but essentially, you know, ensure that this arrangement is long lasting. And one of the ways of doing that is to set out all of the requirements, much like you would in the regular, you know, in office employment relationship. And then number one, and this is where I think we will see the way that this goes down, you know, in the future, but number one, ensure that you have the unilateral right to recall the employee at your will. You have the unilateral right to revisit the arrangement at your will. And then on the employee side, I would say, you know, really, really ensuring that you understand the, the boundaries of that relationship and that you've communicated how you want the relationship to proceed. Now to bring it all back and I'll, I'll tie it up, if you are this, this company that's looking to set up this distributed workforce, you're in a much better position than someone who was not distributed and is now transitioning into a distributed team um, because a lot of the employment relationship was already set in stone. Uh, if you are looking to set up a distributed team, really a lot of the considerations are the same as you, the, the only addition would be whether the employee is going to operate in your jurisdiction. And then if they're not, you really want to consider whether or not you're going to hire them as an independent contractor or as an employee, because frankly, the, the freelance or independent contractor arrangement tends to work better when you're dealing with digital nomads and the way to put it forward is not, you know, you're going to lose all of these employee rights. Well, there's a lot to gain as well. You've got freedom. You're not stuck to um, non-competition or non-solicitation obligations. You can probably operate, you know, much more freely and work for many companies. And number, you know, the number one thing is, as you mentioned, Ali, and you, you've experienced it, it's dealing with taxes. You've got all of these benefits that come with being an independent contractor that become very, very hazy when you're an employee as a digital nomad. So those are some of the overlying conditions. And of course we can't go through them all in here, but I invite anyone to go to my website. I've got tons of resources on there. Um, and I've done quite a few of these discussions that are specific to actually one was with running remote and it's available on YouTube that really, really lays out everything you should include in an employment agreement in a remote work policy in an independent contractor agreement and i've gone through it and i don't think anything was missed so i invite anyone to go ahead and look at that that discussion as well and i think what's really great about this list as well um and you're you know putting these expectations and these regulations in the agreement makes a lot of sense but even before that i think taking this information and setting the stage on the job listing and posting itself is a really great thing for hiring managers and HR teams to start thinking about because a job description is the first part of this 
remote relationship where candidates need to know what will be expected of them on the job to know whether or not they want to apply for the job. And so things that you mentioned around the hours, you know, expectations on if you're going to be responsive at certain times of the day, et cetera, is a really great thing to really showcase your employee brand in the job description itself. And with that, I kind of want to flip flip the script a little bit on that employee brand and that job description and revisit um, if there's anything else that should be included in a job specification or a job description that is unique for remote from a skills perspective. What are the new types of responsibilities or characteristics of great remote employees? So Marissa, maybe you can speak a little yeah, bit to I that. Mean you're really not going to love the answer that I'm going to give you. To that question because <laughs> I think that it shouldn't be different. I mean, the, you know, a, a, a talented individual will um, apply themselves, will, uh, you know, understand, communicate with their manager, what their expectations are. Their manager will then manage them to those expectations and they'll get feedback and they'll improve and, um, you know, eventually probably get promoted and, and eventually one day take over your job. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, at Seed we're remote first and we always have been. So I'm based in London. Um, I look after an organisation of just under 50 people um, across Europe, um, some of whom I've never met. So, um, you know, if you apply the basic principles of, of you know, competency and behaviour and, and management, uh, people management, um, you know, through motivation and what have you, I think most of what you're, what you're asking for, Ali, is, is covered whether you're working in an office or you're not working in an office um, or in a you know, shared workspace or whatever it might be. I mean, at, at, if you really pushed me and said, Marissa, I'm going to you know, set you on fire if you don't answer me <laughs> with at least a couple of skills or competencies, I would say that I think the ability to be self-motivated, like somebody who can... Um, you know, in a day, assign themselves daily goals and then work to achieve those daily goals and and um, and kind of course correct throughout the day if they get distracted. So, you know, being incredibly organised, being self-motivated um, and, you know, being someone who's smart enough to not let distractions hijack their day and what have you. I don't know that I'm any of those things and I've been working remotely for nearly 12 years. So, you know... <laughs> I, 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 you know, I would, I would say at a push, I, that kind of individual, someone who, you know, can on their own in a room, motivate themselves to deliver would be perhaps a, a competency set that you would be more looking for from an employee who is based remote. I would caveat that though by saying, if you have great people leaders, great people management practices, whether there's, you know, 5,000 of them in a call centre, or 5,000 of them dotted across the country um, individually in their homes. If, if you've got that strong coaching, strong management, strong, you know, b b managing to expectations, et cetera, it really shouldn't matter where they are. And the reason, and, and the, the example that I would cite is once upon a time, I used to work for a, a company that makes probably all of your phones, those of you who are listening, um, and uh, to, to create a support, um, you know, 1-800, fix my phone or fix my, my computer um, type function. Um, they just physically couldn't hire enough people in the hubs that they had assigned, one of which was actually Barcelona, um, another of which was Austin in Texas and, and Singapore um, for the APEC region. They just could not hire at the scale that they needed. And even with outsourced contracting firms and what have you, they just couldn't get enough people to answer the phones to, to respond to the queries. And it was very, very controversial at the time when they did it that they started putting the um, the uh, tech support folks. They were home office based um, all across the United States, and they would, you know, to to sort of pick up on some of Tara's points. They had, you know, round the clock schedules, shift work, all of that kind of thing. But what it meant was they were able to provide customer support to anyone who was using their phone, their their computer, etc. Um, which one might argue today is the reason why they have completely dominated the device market because of the support that they were able to provide to their customers because they had employees based wherever they, wherever they could find them, wherever the talent was, rather than in some hyper expensive city, 
where they're all miserable and hating life because they're having to commute every day and, and probably nowhere near as productive. So, you know, my views, sorry, Ali, may not be, you know, in line with what everybody else in the world thinks, but I've been managing remote teams now myself since, um, uh, since for as long as I've been living in Europe, I, I was living in Paris, managing people based in London. In my last role, I was living here in London, managing people in Japan. Like, if you have those great principles of people management, whether people are in an office next to you or, or on the other side of the world, you really, really shouldn't have any issues. Yeah, I, I recognize that takes risks, you know. <laughs> of course. And there's a couple of interesting things that stuck out to me in your answer. One is the example of thinking through benefits that might seem obvious, but are worth being said when it comes to hiring talent and thinking about a job description and thinking about how you even get the ball, the ball rolling in the process, the reason why you're doing this. And, and the reason there, there's so many that I could spend a whole, a whole webinar just talking about that, but this idea of finding great talent everywhere and then coupling it with making sure that talent is set up to succeed. And that's why I think the platform, like the Oyster platform is going to really just change the landscape of how we're thinking about really being able to connect with people who want to do great work for interesting companies and do it remotely and it's beneficial for the individual and beneficial for the manager and even having that approach and then setting the clear legal expectations or the clear informal expectations of what that means inside of an organization um, to an earlier point of every tech company, every remote company, while they're doing similar things, may have different expectations of their employees or teammates or contractors is really what's going to shift the connection between a candidate, an employer, and that candidate experience. And then the other really interesting thing that stuck out to me, and I laugh because I, I feel the same way after managing teams in Japan, Poland, uh, San Francisco, whoever in the world could keep up with where I was for the past four years. I don't even remember how many countries I was in and trying to think about what that means for a team. It becomes a learned skill through great management. But I think if we take a step back, we realize that one thing that I've seen remote companies do almost in second nature um, without even thinking about it, that this pandemic, this shift to remote work is forcing people to think about that have worked in offices and have job descriptions just in a file on their computer that they take and post online, is our companies, our, our HR teams actually thinking about some of the basic skills that Marissa, you mentioned that are actually skills you need in an office, um, but remote companies are intentionally talking about them more proactively. Things like, what does good communication look like? What makes a good manager? And how can you concretely talk about those competencies in a way that someone reading your job description says, oh yes, I have that and now I'm gonna apply for this job. I think one of the things that we do really well here at, here at Seed that, um, that we even uh, have implemented in some of the companies that we've been working with is goal setting. And whether that's you know daily goals that add up to weekly goals that add up to monthly, quarterly, and then and then annual goals, and we we do use technology to help us do that. Um, as you know, we have to communicate asynchronously. We have to communicate you know with people who are working um, all around the, all around the the continent. But um, if you have again, if if your requirement of people is that they're in the office at nine o'clock and they leave at six, then that's what they'll do. They'll be there, what they actually do during the day, who knows. But if you've managed through presenteeism, which is a very old fashioned, quite traditional way of managing people, then, then that's what they'll do. If you say to people, I don't care whether you work 10 minutes a day or 10 hours a day, but the goals that I expect you to achieve in the day are to build this wall or to, you know, sort in our case, source 100 candidates, you know, how, how, how long it takes them to do that because you're managing to outcomes, you're managing to goals. Um, and, I, and again, I think in a distributed workforce, um, distributed team, you have to do that because you're not sitting next to the person all day going, hmm, what's that guy doing? I'm going to go look at his screen. You, you can only manage to outputs. And, you know, it's, it's, 
it shouldn't be that groundbreaking, but it really has been for a lot of people. And, you know, if the only way that you can guarantee that your workforce is productive is by watching them next to you, I would venture that you have got a whole nother set of problems that you need to resolve that is not related to where they're working. So um, that for me, you know, in leading remote force teams, uh, remote workforces for as long as there has been, um, that is the key is to have outcomes, to have documented agreed outcomes, you know, to, to um, help Tara with her cases that she might have to deal with later on, everything's documented. Um, it's shared, it's agreed, it's public, it's visible. And then a, an additional kind of value that I would add as well, you talked a lot about communication, Ali, and I would kind of take that a level higher and say, when you aren't sitting next to each other, when you can't hear what's going on, when you're not having those kind of traditional informal kinds of chats with each other, transparency and, and, um, and openness, it's, it's core to how we operate as a business. I would argue that it should be core to how any human relationship should operate. You know, I, you know, I find if people aren't lying to each other, generally they get on better. Um, but again, it can be quite controversial to say things like transparency and openness should be core values of, of a communication strategy to the point where our CEO and founder, you know, talks regularly to the company about our position, about how we're doing, whether it's great, whether it's not so great. And people feel involved and they feel committed and, and you know, that helps create the culture of our company as well. So, um, yeah, that's my little extra two cents on the whole remote thing. Yeah, the goal Stop setting. Now. <laughs> the, no, we want you both to talk. Um, the goal, the goal setting conversation is quite interesting to me, um, and I'm curious how goal setting might also impact hiring forecasting, and how can companies, if they're not having clues about workers being productive in an office, and again, I I also laugh at that when <laughs> when people say to me about managing remote employees, and they're like, well, how do you know if they're working? I'm like, well, how do you know if they're working in their office, and they're not just reading the news or dreaming about vacations and, and things like that? Um, when you strip away time, and, and this is this is interesting to me because time is very easy in terms of those legal regulations we're talking about, but from a goal setting standpoint, might make things ha harder. So when you take all of these smaller details into consideration, how can companies remotely get better at forecasting and developing their hiring strategy? It's, if, if you can point me to the company that has perfected workforce planning, um, I'd like to know who they are because I'm sure that all of us would pay them thousands and thousands of pounds to find out the secret because, you know, I've never worked anywhere. And, and to be fair, I've largely worked for companies that were listed. So your workforce planning couldn't happen until the board had met and the board don't meet until after the beginning of the calendar year, the financial year. So it's just never, ever been a perfect process anywhere that I've worked. If I would bring it back though to, to some simple examples, if your revenue goal is to achieve X and on average your employees are able to sell you know half of X or, or a quarter of X you, you sort of work back from those company goals um, to see how many people that you need to, to hire in order to, to be able to achieve those goals then you layer in things like span of control for management um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can read from Laszlo Bock about what good span of control looks like um, and then when it comes to things like, you know, adding throughout the year, if your goals are increasing, if you're expecting more, if your business is starting to boom, then you layer in people. But equally, you have to have those tough conversations about when you should be unlayering people as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if the goals aren't being achieved, if your performance is below expectations, then, then your workforce plan needs to adapt. I don't think, and, 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 you know, again, Ali, you've got perhaps a bit more experience of this from the HR standpoint, I don't think that anyone is developing workforce plans with a view to assigning roles to be remote or not remote. I think most companies are saying, here's our workforce plan. We need a thousand people by the end of the year. And as a company, we're willing to tolerate that 50% of them aren't based in the office. And that's based on how many desks we have and how much it costs for us to have remote working um, individuals. But I don't think people are getting that scientific yet where they're able to go, these set of roles can be remote based, these set of roles can't be. 
unless there's an obvious physical tie to the location, they're the barista for the coffee, to the mm -hmm. cafe, cafe that you have in the office or something. I, I think it's it's still very, very loose. And I, I think there's quite a bit of work to come there um, from, you know, folks that are much more in the kind of um, HR operations world to be able to partner with things like finance teams and facilities teams to work out what is the ideal mix um, and, and, you know, Facebook have, have gone 50%, you know, we'll have half. Um, and maybe, you know, two years from now, they'll say, actually, we could probably do 70 or no, we really can only make 30. I don't think anyone's got that scientific about it yet um, as to how they could do that. Yeah. And upon hearing this, Tara, I'm curious, like thinking about it from a percentage breakdown, obviously, like the barista example is, is quite a strong legal case to to mandate someone be in a physical location but outside of that when you're designing roles are there any legal implications on which roles are allowed to be remote and which ro roles should be tied to a physical location no absolutely not i think really what it would depend on is if there was some expectation as i've mentioned for them to come into the head office at any given point in time um, and again, you really, really need to be mindful of where you are setting up your head office or what jurisdiction will govern the employment relationship. And I think beyond that, it's really, you know, if anything, this pandemic has proven that many of these roles can be completed remotely, even where previously contemplated, it wasn't the case. So really, as long as you're clear and, and I, I applaud Marissa on mentioning it. Really, documentation is key. As long as you're clear on what the expectations of, as you mentioned, Ali are, and what the what the context or the boundaries of the relationship will be, there should be absolutely no uh, no roadblocks. And so, if you are contemplating hiring this workforce or creating this workforce, really the key that you want to think about is independent contractor or digital nomad versus remote worker. Um, but when you're, and this is a great question, I've never actually dealt with the job description. That's really, really interesting for me. And it's probably where someone like Marissa comes in or Ali, you in your previous role. Um, you, you definitely want to think about what the operatable skills are when you're creating that job description. But in terms of whether there are limitations, I, I would say from a legal perspective, you want to think about if they're going to be independent contractor or employee and which jurisdiction is going to govern the relationship. And then one thing that often doesn't get talked about, but really we should be talking about are the disabilities that are associated with this type of work. So you want to think about the physical capabilities of someone in this workspace. You want to think about their mental health. You want to think about their physical health. And if anything, I would say those are certain requirements of them working remotely on a large scale. And so, you know, it's, it's one thing that again, will be very interesting in this pandemic is sure everyone's transitioned to remote work and it's totally possible, but how do you deal with somebody who I don't know, has a lot of anxiety and depression that comes from, at least in our case, where kids have been home from March until now and possibly continuing through the fall or, you know, a precarious relationship that causes certain mental health issues. So start thinking about some of those things, you know, and that's something that's not contemplated ever or at all. Um, so that would, I would say, qualifies as some of the limitations, but otherwise, you know, hire remotely, go in there, you know, create a flexible work plan. And that's something that I think we'll see happen here in the fall is, you know, sometimes you can come in if you have a client meeting, you come in. Otherwise, the majority of the time you work from home. And let's not forget about, you know, co-working spaces, which will hopefully open back up. And Ali, you've mentioned you'd return to. So also think about yeah. those yeah, I think that's great. Um, so just wrapping this up, I'm seeing if there's any last questions coming through from our attendees, but I think some of the topics we talked about today, if they can be summed up in one word, um, would be expectations. I think being very clear about what you're looking for from a candidate in terms of skills. If it's a manager, what does good management look like in your organization? Thinking through some of the legal things like the hours on site, recalling employees, and thinking through things 
even after you start hiring and writing the job description, but what does that employee contract look like? What are the benefits? Are all things that you can reach out to um, legal employment law firms like Remote Law Canada for? That's something that Oyster provides in their employment platform is trying to understand the country norms of where you're going to be hiring and thinking about how you can tie all of that into a streamlined process um, and using some of the tips around goal setting that Marissa has explained um, as it relates to seed. And another just interesting thought that, that I had today is while everybody's tackling these challenges in a different way, at the core, navigating it together and continuing to have these conversations and listening to your candidates, as Marissa said right at the beginning, will help companies continue to evolve into the space and to be hiring effectively. So thank you again, everybody, for your time today. I know some people might be a little bit uh, Zoom fatigued as, we, as we've seen in the past, but I thought this was a really dynamic conversation leading us up all the way to the very end. So I'd like to thank Marissa at Seed and Tara at Remote Law Canada, as well as the team at Oyster and putting this together. And don't forget, we have two more of these coming up. So on September 2nd, you'll be able to learn more about recruiting and reaching out to candidates in a remote setting. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Have a Thank great you. afternoon or morning, depending on where you are yeah. in the world. <laughs> Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you.